The red fox is Japan's most legendary animal. This pair are courting on the island of Hokkaido. There's a story here of how the tiger once challenged the fox to a race around the world. The winner was to be lord over all the animals. The fox agreed. But cunningly, he held on to the tiger's tail all the way until the very last minute before dashing past to win the race. And so it goes, that's why there are no tigers here. And foxes became the lords of Hokkaido. Where they have ruled over animals that for centuries have been celebrated in Japanese art. But the Lord of Hokkaido doesn't have such an easy life. Even in March, the sea around his kingdom is a frozen jumble of ice. He comes upon a dead seal, but it's frozen and difficult to feed on. This find could last him for weeks, but others have seen it too. A carrion crow. And on the horizon, a white-tailed sea eagle. The fox abandons it, for the time being. Attracted by the crow's call, the sea eagle comes to investigate. With a wingspan of more than two meters, it's Europe and Asia's equivalent of North America's bald eagle. The crow is expecting a meal. But first, it must wait for the eagle to rip open the frozen corpse with its more powerful beak and talons. Both these birds usually scavenge together and stay here all winter sharing the fox's frozen kingdom. For four months, Hokkaido is smothered by snow and ice. Such bitter winters put the Japanese off settling here in large numbers until the last century. Before then, this chilly land was home to the Ainu, a quite different race of hunting people whose way of life has now largely died out. They are thought to have come from Siberia, but no one really knows for certain. Siberia is very close, and is responsible for Japan's bitterly cold winters. Icy winds sweep across the sea from Russia and bearing the brunt of it, Japan's northernmost island, Hokkaido. Most of its wildlife has more in common with Siberia than the rest of Japan, and its wild character still remains today, especially here in the northeast. The Lord of Hokkaido is well protected against the freezing wind by a luxurious winter coat which grows much thicker in cold climates. He's the same species of red fox that is found right across Siberia, Europe and North America, the most widespread and successful carnivore on Earth. He continues his search for food among the coastal dunes, a search made more urgent because he has a family to feed. Lingering at some sweet briars, luckily for him, their berries have lasted throughout the winter. Rich in energy-giving sugars, they are vital for his survival, when live prey is hard to come by.
Beyond the dunes, a railway runs along a broad, flat valley and through a surprisingly European-looking landscape of farms, fields and windbreaks. Seeker deer tend to move into these lowland farming areas in winter to escape even colder weather in the mountains. They are shy of humans and keep to the shelter of woodlands where they feed on twigs and bark. It's still very wintry as spring approaches, but even so, it's now that animals start producing their young. At the edge of this copse, the fox's mate is confined to her underground den, nursing their seven cubs, which are only a few days old. She surrounds them with her warm body, making sure they don't die from the cold. They can't see yet, and they are so small and helpless that for the first two weeks their mother hardly ever leaves the den. She has to rely on her mate to keep her supplied with food. Having a family to feed forces the male to travel many miles each day searching for food. These are the remains of a hare he killed yesterday. A sharp overnight frost has frozen it stiff. Because they are so common, foxes are well known to the people here. Indeed, the old Hokkaido name for them means our neighbors. The more modern name is Kita Kitsune, or Northern Fox, which is now the symbol of Hokkaido. Even in almost freezing water, new life is also stirring. Salmon eggs are hatching, the start of a remarkable story. On emerging, they are less than an inch long and carry around a huge yolk sack. This provides them with food for a burst of rapid growth. A couple of weeks later, they're over twice as long. Their yolk sacs have shrunk and they begin to move away from their pebble bed in vast shoals. These fast flowing streams don't freeze over, unlike most rivers here, so they attract the pied kingfisher. Sixty feet up, a white-tailed sea eagle incubates her eggs. It will take five months to raise her young, so she starts nesting earlier in the year than most birds here. Some of these birds are only just beginning their courtship. The Japanese greatly admire red-crowned cranes, which pair for life and can live for more than 50 years so they symbolize long life and a true and faithful marriage. They're called the birds of happiness. They are found nowhere else in Japan, and in early spring they get together for an extraordinary display. They celebrate their partnership by calling together and performing ritual dances. Adult pairs usually dance together, but sometimes juveniles without a partner get caught up in the excitement.
The cranes stay in Hokkaido all year. Distinctly Asian residents of an island that is home to a surprising number of European animals. A red squirrel has spotted another male trespassing on his territory. After such a rough reception, the rival retreats. And with him out of the way, the victor returns to his prospective mate, who is otherwise engaged. She is more interested in food than courtship, and tells him so. Nearby, a great spotted woodpecker. Like the red squirrel, its presence here is a clue to Hokkaido's close links with Siberia and Europe. The persistent male pursues his unwilling partner into the treetops. The great spotted woodpecker has found a beetle larva and chisels out a neat hole to get to it. The black woodpecker, on the other hand, is less refined and will literally take the branch to pieces to get at ants inside. It's another European species which is found nowhere else in Japan. The squirrels observe an uneasy truce. Two pairs of whooper swans display to each other a ritual ceremony to strengthen their pair bond although arguments erupt if strangers get too close. They've just arrived, along with thousands of others from wintering grounds all over Japan, to gather in early April on the still frozen lakes of northern Hokkaido. Known in Japan as Ohakucho, or the big white birds, they are anticipating the arrival of the spring thaw, and preparing for their migration north to Siberian nesting grounds. Keeping their feathers in good condition is vital if they are to survive the flight ahead. April's southerly winds bring warmer air, loosening winter's icy grip on the land. Off the north coast, the pack ice that covered the Sea of Okhotsk begins to thaw and break up.
Now the swans depart, following this thaw northwards. Ahead of them lies a journey of up to 2,000 miles to Arctic breeding grounds. They set out over the coast of Hokkaido, heading across the sea of Okhotsk towards Siberia. The land they leave is rapidly becoming free of snow. A line of dunes separates the coast from a flat inland plain where fields have been cleared from the forest. All part of our foxes' territory, which covers about four square kilometers on either side of the railway track. It's only this century that the original forests of walnut, lime, oak and maple have been cleared for farmland. And right next to the farm is the copse, now free from snow, where the vixen has her den. Her cubs are now about six weeks old and spend more and more time above ground. This den has been used by foxes for years. And when she dies, it might be inherited by one of her daughters. Foxes usually have four or five cubs, but she has seven, which is a large family. She looks rather scrawny because her thick winter fur is molting and being replaced by a shorter summer coat. But she is thin, and that's because she has to cater for seven hungry cubs. Living so close to the farm, she's used to the commotion of cattle being turned out to pasture beside the copse. Hokkaido looks very different from the rest of Japan. Rice doesn't grow well here because of the cooler climate, so instead of rice paddies, there are dairy farms. Cows are considered a great novelty by the Japanese, and tourists from the south come specially to see these farms. One of the first spring flowers, a kind of wild arum called misobasho, appears beside the stream. And in the waters below, the young salmon feeding on tiny insect larvae have grown to three inches long. Although for many, this is as big as they'll get. Danger lurks everywhere. He's got good cause to look worried. Trout are particularly treacherous, even though they are one of the salmon's closest relatives. And crayfish will have any they can get hold of. It's a perilous time for the young salmon. More than half those hatched end up being eaten now. And it's not only dangerous here. There's another unexpected predator waiting. A Japanese wagtail. An injured mallard has no chance against the male fox who's busy hunting for his family watched by a ruby throat, a summer visitor to Hokkaido. The vixen meets him at the edge of the copse. She's still wary of letting him too near the cubs, so when he resumes hunting, she takes the food to the den. She makes no attempt to share the food out among the cubs. They must fight it out amongst themselves. But she doesn't want them to drag it too far away from the den, so she steps in to retrieve the kill, taking it to a place where she can keep an eye on the cubs. A hierarchy is emerging among the cubs. Like little thugs, they fight over every scrap of food. Should food become scarce, the cubs at the bottom of the hierarchy will be the first to suffer, and the weakest may die. 
the vixen and her mate will have to work hard to make sure they all have enough to eat. And now that the sea eagle chicks have hatched, their parents too are busy providing food. The female joins the male at the nest to tend the chicks. Although hundreds of eagles spend winter in Hokkaido, only a handful nest here. The rest have migrated north to breed in Siberia. The few sea eagles that do remain feed mainly on fish, so they're no threat to the fox cubs. They are about 10 weeks old and no longer confined to the den, but are still accompanied by their mother who keeps an eye on them. They are perfectly at ease in broad daylight because here, unlike Europe, they're not persecuted. Foxes are popular in Japan and are welcomed by most farmers because they help to keep down the numbers of rats. Too small to kill a rat yet, one of the cubs practices his skills. For centuries, the fox has dominated Japanese folklore. There's an old belief that foxes are endowed with magic powers and that to kill one would bring bad luck. And there are many tales of how the fox delights in playing tricks on people, like those where the fox transforms itself into a charming girl and with a bewitching smile enchants men and steals their hearts. One story tells of a young fox intent on such mischief. It turned itself into a beautiful woman and strolled into town. But instead of admiring glances from the men she intended to deceive, she was greeted with howls of laughter. It turned out that the fox hadn't quite mastered the art of transformation and the cause of so much amusement was that its bushy tail was still sticking out behind. Chasing tails and wrestling takes up much of the cubs' time between meals. The vicious fights that mark the setting up of the hierarchy are over. Each cub knows where it stands, as it were, and they become more playful. The sea eagle chicks are never playful, but like the fox cubs, they're growing fast. The female regularly feeds them with tiny pieces of fish. Her mate perches nearby, standing guard over the nesting territory and ready to confront intruders, like this rival male. In Hokkaido, such encounters are rare because so few sea eagles nest here. But further north in Siberia, battles between adjacent nesting pairs are more frequent. 
sometimes becoming so fierce that eggs and chicks are at risk. The young salmon have outgrown the river where they were born. After only a few months in fresh water, they start swimming downstream toward the sea. None stay behind. They all go to feed and grow in the northern Pacific, traveling tens of thousands of miles during their time at sea. Crossing sandy shallows at the river mouth, their bodies are adapting for marine life. Salmon are one of the very few fish that can migrate between fresh water and the sea, a transition that would kill most fish within minutes. Until they reach deeper water, they can be picked off by turns. But in four years' time, the few salmon that have survived the gauntlet of predators will return. This is the world that the young foxes must learn to survive in. Near the farm is a cemetery, and the vixen pauses there briefly while taking three of her cubs on a training trip. Such guided tours are an important part of the cubs growing up because they get to know the family territory and learn about its dangers. She calls her stray cub back to safety. And she's quite unafraid of the car. If it's not cars, it's kids. They're on a training trip of their own. But the cubs couldn't care less. Meanwhile, the male fox tries to take one of his cubs on a trip across a field full of cows by the copse. But the cub's very dubious about the whole venture and doesn't want to go. He's worried about the cows and nothing his father does can persuade him otherwise. The male appears to lose his patience. But the cub's too big to be picked up by the scruff of his neck. Ignoring his father, he's much happier exploring the edge of the field. So his father sets off anyway and hopes the cub will follow. He couldn't be more wrong. That just confirmed the cub's worst fears. There's absolutely no way he's going to cross that field now. It's July and summer is well underway. Temperatures will be in the 70s or even higher for the next couple of months. Many schools now run field classes for children to encourage their interest in the countryside. At this time of year, there's plenty going on for the children to look out for.
Summer's lush greenery provides a welcome contrast to winter's meagre diet for this male seeker deer. A hungry woodpecker chick keeps both parents busy satisfying its voracious appetite. The sea eagle chicks won't be confined to the nest for much longer. But even when they can fly, they'll depend on their parents for food for another six weeks or so. The reluctant squirrel couple obviously did get together. Two of their offspring are exploring. A little hesitantly, perhaps, they're not yet expert climbers. Hokkaido's other squirrel is the Siberian chipmunk, which is found nowhere else in Japan. It has a taste for clover flowers, which are rich in nectar. The fox family have moved from the farm to this potato field beside the railway line, where they'll spend the rest of the summer. The cubs are now old enough to be left on their own, but when the vixen's around, she'll often liven up their games. Play is not just for fun, it also helps develop the cubs' hunting skills. Skills which they must acquire before they have any chance of surviving on their own. Suddenly the vixen spots her mate approaching. He ignores her greeting and rushes to confront an apparent threat. It is actually the cameraman. You'd never see a European fox being so bold. This brave defense of the family is because he's not as used to the cameraman as the rest of them are. They don't mind at all. The vixen greets him as he calms down. Grooming each other helps to reinforce the bond between them. A bond that remains strong until the cubs have grown up. Most evenings, the male turns up with food for the cubs. As usual, it's first come, first served. He gets an enthusiastic reception. It was thought that the male fox gave the vixen virtually no help in raising the cubs. But here at least, he has played a vital supporting role. Supplying the vixen with food when the cubs were born, then hunting for the cubs, supervising training trips, not always successfully, and defending the family territory. The cubs are now about four months old, and that all seven have survived this far is thanks in part to their hard-working father. But before long, the bonds that hold the family together will loosen and then break and the cubs will have to face the world on their own.
About the time the young foxes are leaving, adult salmon are arriving home, returning after four years in the Pacific. When they reach their home coast, they swim along it until they recognize the very same river where they were born by its smell. But how they find their way around millions of square miles of ocean back to Hokkaido in the first place is not clear. It's possible that they're guided by the Earth's magnetic field. On arrival, they congregate for a while around the mouth of the river, getting used to the change from salt water back to fresh water. As soon as they swim into the river, they stop feeding. And there's no going back, so their fate is sealed. They have only one purpose and function now, and that is to get upstream to spawn. In the past, people were mystified by and very grateful for the salmon's return. Salmon often made the difference between starvation and survival to these remote riverside villages. They prayed to the river god, we could not exist without you, River, so we thank you for your favors and beg of you that this year the salmon will run thick in the streams. Today, salmon have disappeared from many rivers because of overfishing. Netting is now strictly controlled. These fish, weighing as much as 15 pounds, will provide eggs for local hatcheries where young salmon are reared to restock the rivers. Only a small proportion are taken here. The rest are allowed to continue their struggle upstream. Hokkaido's salmon rivers are generally only a few miles long, so it takes the salmon no more than a couple of days to reach the headwaters. When they reach the spawning area, each female digs out a shallow pit on the gravel bottom. When she's finished, the male draws alongside. Eggs and sperm have to be released together. The eggs can only be fertilized within a minute of being shed because they quickly harden in the cold water, preventing the sperm from entering. Afterwards, the female buries the eggs to prevent them from being washed away. and then they simply die of exhaustion. Of all the thousands of salmon that traveled upriver, none will survive. All their energy has been spent on this massive final act of reproduction, their lives sacrificed for a new generation. But the carcasses of the spent salmon are not wasted. They're a feast for thick-billed crows. The fox family have split up, and on their own, the young fox's hunting skills are put to the test. This one is trying to catch a vole. He's not very good at it. He wasn't expecting the vole to bite back. And it manages to slip away, saved by the young fox's inexperience. 
another cub wanders away from home. Hunger often forces young foxes to scavenge around farms and villages. This one has learned that roadsides are good places to find scraps. But it's a difficult and dangerous time for them. Road accidents, disease and starvation take a heavy toll. Out of this litter of seven, there is little chance that more than one of them will make it through the winter. But typically resourceful, the young fox hides away surplus food in a rotten stump. Storing food is the fox's way of ensuring against lean times ahead. And it may help this one to be a survivor. It's becoming much colder. Plants and animals are getting ready for the winter that is just round the corner. The Siberian chipmunk is now busy stuffing his cheek pouches with food to hoard in his underground burrow. And a raccoon dog. He's also on the lookout for food. He'll eat virtually anything, including chipmunks. chipmunks too quick. The raccoon dog at this time of year is fat and needs to be because he's the only member of the dog family that hibernates during the winter. The first snow arrives in the mountains at the end of October and rapidly spreads down into the lowlands. And in its wake, Sika deer move back down from the high country. They're never far from cover. A haunting whistle betrays the presence of a group of stags traveling nearby. But the females and their almost fully grown calves keep their distance. They live apart from the males during winter. Flocks of bramblings pass through Hokkaido on their way to spend winter on the rice stubble fields of the south. and travelling with them, a rustic bunting. Very few small birds stay to face the winter here. It's just too cold, and there's so little food to be had. People from the rest of Japan think of Hokkaido as the wild north. And certainly in November, as winter closes in, it does become bleak and desolate. Temperatures rarely creep above freezing by day, and at night, they can plunge to minus 25 degrees Celsius. Hokkaido is actually no further north than the French Riviera, but it's at this time of year that being so close to Siberia really makes a difference. Near the field where they played in summer lies the body of one of the young foxes, finished off by cold and hunger. 
This young male, one of the litter's dominant cubs, is doing all right for himself and is starting to establish his own territory, which extends to the coast. Beyond the dunes, fishermen face bitterly cold winds blowing from Siberia. They are after cod, which abound in these cold waters. beach is a good place to check if anything edible has been washed up. His thick winter coat is great for keeping him warm. Unfortunately, it's not waterproof, and that water was extremely cold. By Christmas, it's cold enough for the sea to start freezing over as the pack ice closes in. When the pack ice bunches up, fish are often trapped and pushed out onto the surface. So for one of the young white-tailed sea eagles, this frozen sea becomes a good hunting ground. A larger, Stella's sea eagle tries to steal the fish. February is the coldest time of the year. Simply surviving is difficult enough, yet the young male's attention is on other things. He's excited by the smell of a vixen in his territory. She's leaving urine signals that tell him she's coming to heat. Although she's been living in his territory all winter, they've had almost nothing to do with one another. Until now, that is, when they seek each other out. She spots the male who's been tracking her scent. Vixen leads him on a long courtship chase. Any tension between them gradually disappears as they get used to each other.
until finally, on an ice-bound shore, they mate. They may stay joined like this for an hour or even longer. Locking together for so long ensures that she becomes fertilized. He seems a little jaded by the whole affair. But she appears thrilled at the prospect of a new generation of lords and ladies of Hokkaido.